Uh, so I'm going to briefly go over uh, the basics of the museum, why this learning model is beneficial for museums, um, what then is beneficial for the MOOC, and kind of what I'm doing with it. Uh, this is a test run that we're going to be doing at Pepperdine University, hopefully in January of 2014. And even though it is not run yet, I have run into quite a few uh, trials and tribulations in getting it off the ground, both with the institution of Pepperdine as well as the art institution on campus. Uh, first off, did you click? Yes, I do. I said I'm Roland Moe. I'm a doctoral candidate at Pepperdine University studying learning technologies, and I am not a stepchild of a PhD program. Uh, EDD is a scholar practitioner degree. Um, I chose it specifically for that. Um, my scholarship is MOOCs, and if you're interested in reading any of my MOOC opining, I do that in all MOOCs all the time. Um, but my practical model is the MOOCseum, um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. Uh, the MOOC of, MOOCseum, of course, is the blending of MOOC and museum. Very nifty and easy to do. Um, why did I choose that? Uh, there's a benefit for both parties. First off, um, MOOCs and museums are both learning environments. We don't think about that a lot with museums anymore, but uh, the MOOC and the museum are both institutionalized learning environments. Uh, they both run around very specific start and end points. They are very locked into a space and time. Uh, with a museum, you'll have a roving exhibition that comes through uh, six to eight weeks. With a MOOC, same sort of thing. You know, we'll be doing this course for six to eight weeks. And the forebears of both the MOOC and the museum were designed with the hope of instigating two-way communication between learners and experts or subjects and audiences. And as we know, with museums and with MOOCs, the dominant paradigm of both of those has somewhat gotten away from that two-way communication. Um, so, a lot of struggles facing museums. The picture I have is of the Detroit Museum of Art. If you've been paying attention to the news, they are struggling. The city of Detroit is struggling with paying the bills, and one of their considerations is to sell off the works at the Detroit Museum of Art. Why would you do that? Why would you take some of the great artifacts of human history and sell them to the highest bidder? Well, if you don't care about the museum, that's a really good reason to do that. And museums have lost a lot of authority in our society. Um, Michael Peter Edson is the director of Strategic New Media at the Smithsonian. He did a straw poll of about 1,000 12 to 18 year olds, asking them, where does, this, where does the Smithsonian rank as an authority or an expert in society? And it was statistically insignificant. Newspapers, television shows, personalities were the people who ranked as experts and as authorities, not the Smithsonian. And that's very difficult if you are an institution designed specifically in regards to being an authority and being a place for the, the effusion and increase of knowledge. Um, museums are viewed as a place where things go when they're dead. And we're going to go we're gonna walk through, we're going to look at them. It's kind of like going to Ikea. You walk through, you see bedrooms, you see kitchens, you see that, uh, that chair, that I think it's a po-yang, and the button keeps pushing it over and over and over again. Same sort of thing happening. Same thing with museum. There's the Degas, there's the Monet. If you're at the Science Museum, press the button, and the same event happens to every single person. The balls fly down, you get the statistics, you know, 50% in the middle, 20% on each side, 10% on the extremes. Um, that is not interactive. Uh, we have a declining patronage on multiple sides, not just in interest, but also in people coming and governments paying money for it. Um, and they're very archaic views at the museum. Uh, the museum is very afraid of losing ownership of the image. If we lose ownership of the image, we are not an authority anymore. And this isn't just Walter Benjamin and the art, artist in the mechanical age of reproduction. This goes all the way back to the start of museums 300 years ago when the worry was forgers. So the first museums that you can think of were in fact, uh, large ones were French. And they were ways for the French to kind of show off uh, their art. Um, but part of the reason they did that was in order to stop forgers. So you had a place that you knew this was an authentic, and these were people who were trained to be able to spot authentics in, this, in the place of forgers. Um, in America, that happened more in historical houses where community members would come together and take artifacts and say, these are the important artifacts of our society, and these are the ones that we know are not forgeries because of A, B, and C. Um, I love how I keep going to click the screen when the computer's right here. How? When Stanley Kubrick made 2001 in the 60s, computers were large mainframes in big rooms like this. And he thought, what's going to happen in 2001? They're going to get bigger. We're going to walk into it. We're going to have this interactive experience in the computer. And he was wrong. We went from mainframe computers to personal computers to mobile computers. All right? We have taken technology and moved in a completely different direction. And the museum hasn't. 
We've gotten bigger, and not just exhibits. And granted, it's cool. It's really cool to walk into a big interactive exhibit like this when there aren't a whole lot of people, and it's just you getting to be immersed. But this is the structure has grown larger. If you look at museums, the people that you interact with when you walk into a museum are often going to be docents or volunteers, or are going to be security guards who are probably temp labor or part time. Uh, the main focus of the museum human resources are administrators, and those, just like at uh, higher education institutions, those numbers have skyrocketed. So what are we doing with our museum? We've gotten so far away in 300 years from this idea of two-way communication, and we're so focused on this very assembly line product that we're putting out. Walk up here, read this article, go on to the next piece. Not even an article, read this blurb. Um, you know, we need to make a change. And luckily, the winds are moving in the right direction for that. All right? Um, I was going over this presentation with my wife, and she mentioned uh, this quote that many, many people have said, every time I look at a great piece of art, I see something different. Each experience is unique. All right? Um, and the piece of art that I chose specifically was a self-portrait by Van Gogh from 1889. Um, Van Gogh, next to Jackson Pollock, is the most valuable artist in human history. Uh, his paintings broke, often sell for 80, 90 million dollars. His most recent self-portraits have sold upwards of 80 million dollars, and that was about 10 years ago. This painting hasn't sold for a long time. It's probably worth a lot more than that. And it's an open access image. The National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. has decided that all of their images that fall under copyright law and are in the public domain are open access. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but museums have been so reticent to embrace open technology and open access that they have gone above and beyond the call of duty to stop us from being able to access things that should be in the public domain. Um, to the point that museums that do put their images online, and those are growing, but they're still a small number, often will do very low-res images. So you can't utilize them for any sort of reproduction or reuse. Um, the National Gallery of Art said, no. It's out there. This is what's going to happen. Okay? This is the world that we live in today. One interesting thing, actually, I thought this was really um, unique. The Mona Lisa is a public domain piece of art. But Marcel, Marcel Duchamp's Mona Lisa is not. And so, we can do anything we want with the Mona Lisa, but we can't do anything we want with the guy who started this whole movement of reuse and redistribution in art. <laughs> One of the ironies of our society. But if the National Gallery of Art is moving in this direction, can't we get our local museums to do the same thing? Um, if any of you guys follow me on Twitter, I'm kind of a stickler for definitions. I really believe that words have meanings and they need to, in order for us to have a conversation, we need to understand that same meaning. Um, so, I love this James Smithson quote uh, from, he was, of course, James Smithson of the Smithsonian. The role of museums is to facilitate the increase and diffusion of knowledge among citizens. Now, he didn't say among citizens, he said among men. Our notion has changed of what a citizen is over time, and so we're going to embrace that. Um, unfortunately, George left before I could ask him, who said this? But George told this to me a while back, um, that he heard this from someone. The purpose of education is to help foster citizens to be publicly useful and privately happy. So with those ideas of what museum is and what education is, we can get into defining what a MOOC is. And we've been talking about that for the last three days. We've come to a pretty good consensus. We still don't know. We have all of these ranging definitions that are going on, and we can't pinpoint what it is. All right. So all of us are talking about it. A few of us are coming up with considerations, but in the mainstream, there's one variable we were talking about, and it's a very one-sided discussion of what that variable is. So what I have defined for um, the museum is as follows. Um, I don't know if anyone was at EDUCAUSE a couple of weeks ago in Anaheim, but uh, somebody there, I don't remember exactly who it was, said every term in MOOC is negotiable. And this is something I disagree with. Um, because in the mainstream, it is not negotiable. We know what a MOOC is in the mainstream. Thomas Friedman has defined a MOOC for us. Um, David Brooks has defined a MOOC for us. Sebastian Thrun, Andrew Ning, and uh, Anna Agarwal have defined a MOOC for us. All right? And we are sitting here kind of playing and saying, well, it's all negotiable. Maybe, but we have to understand that it's not like that outside of this room. <laughs> so this definition is pretty basic, but it does give us a little more understanding than the Oxford Dictionary definition. Um, and the one thing that I do know here that is somewhat different than if you were looking at, and you notice I won't say CMOOC or XMOOC, um, and it's for the same reason. Uh, it's a very helpful term. Osvaldo Rodriguez came up with that a couple of years ago. But outside of this room, you won't hear people say CMOOC. And inside this room, when we say XMOOC, we largely don't mean it in a positive light. <laughs> so 
we have to understand, we lost, we kind of lost the term. That, 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 that ship sailed, unfortunately, and we need to reclaim it in other ways. And Mooksium certainly is a healthy way of doing that, but as we're doing different things, we need to understand that there is a definition of MOOC, there's a history of MOOC, and um, the history has now been overwhelmed by this very artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence machine learning idea of what a MOOC is. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing, that's just a thing. Um, theoretical foundation for the museum specifically. All right, uh, We've talked a lot about connectivism at this conference. Um, I was really disappointed with uh, Andrew Ning's keynote on Wednesday because I felt like with this audience that he had here, there was a prime opportunity to discuss artificial intelligence and machine learning as a theoretical foundation for his style of MOOC, and he passed on it. And throughout the history, we can see that all of those developers are passing on it to the point that I had to go back to 1984 to find a true theoretical article talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I'm sure that there are other ones that have happened since then, but really in the last 5, 10, 15 years, there isn't a lot of theoretical writing happening on that. It's much more practical. Um, but obviously there are many more things that are going on inside of a museum. museum. Um, collaborative knowledge building. This is kind of a marriage between connectivism and constructivism. Uh, the idea here is you get a cohort or a cadre of people together. You can't build a community, but you get hope that you coalesce them, you scaffold them, and community ends up evolving. If you look at Wenger and communities of practice, you give them the right tools, the right information, and hopefully that will happen. Um, and they end up building artifacts, and the sum of what they build is greater than the parts that they bring to it. Uh, the participatory museum is one of my favorite ideas. If, you have, if you're interested in museums, Nina Simon wrote a book called The Participatory Museum in 2010. It's online, free download, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and what she is saying, and I want to get this specifically, she's very interested in that two-way communication aspect of the museum. So too often it's been, we're the museum, we stand here, we tell you what you're supposed to think, and you thank us for that by paying us and walking through and feeling good about yourself by looking at these artifacts. Um, and in fact, museums were evolved 300 years ago for citizens to discuss and debate, and it wasn't just art, but it was history, and it was science, and it was culture and we've lost that. And even though we have these great digital tools, all we're doing with them is we're either replicating the existing museum and putting it online, or using the digital tool to advertise the existing museum, or we're afraid of the digital tool and we're ignoring it. So what Nina Simon is saying is we need to get participation, we need to get community back in these community centers. Um, and there's a little bit happening there with digital and augmented museums, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And then with open education resources. So a lot of the images might be fair use, and a lot of the images might be uh, public domain. But that doesn't mean that the articles and the primary source texts about that art are. So uh, copyright law, as we think of it in the United States, 1923 on, is not public domain. That is still copyright protected. How much great writing about art that we can still consider relevant today happened before 1923? That's a problem. We need to get some of these things into the ether for us to discuss. So, the museum. What are the tenets of the museum? Um, first off, it's a traditional MOOC. And when I say traditional here, I mean that George Siemens, Stephen Downs, Alec Koros, 2008 kind of MOOC aspect, okay? So you get a group of people together, coalesced around a concept, and they discuss it. And uh, it's a lot of facilitation of discussion, a lot of zones of proximal development, experts and novices coming together, a thousand points of light. Um, and I also have that wonderful Chronicle of Higher Education graphic up there because we can't ignore the other side of the MOOC, especially on an institutional level. I went to Pepperdine University. I said, I have this great idea, and you guys should adopt it here. And the chief financial officer said, I really like this idea because at Pepperdine University, we've been doing online learning for over 20 years, and we're in the forefront, and we don't want to jump on with the MOOC provider yet. But how are we going to make money? And I said, that's the thing. It's not about that. There's so much more that happens than just making money with that. He said, hmm. If I'm not going to make money and I can't control the people who are in this, that's a very scary place for us. So maybe we should brand with Coursera or edX and put our wares there. And so there's a discussion happening at all sorts of universities of the weight of doing things in the name of education versus, well, yeah, we're in the name of education, but we have a brand, we have affiliation, and we have an endowment, and we have alumni, and we have boosters that we have to support, and all of those considerations are playing as well. Um, and that's not just an institutional thing. I had that same issue with the art museum that I will talk about later. Um, interesting thing happened in the news yesterday. Uh, the Getty Center, one of the biggest repositories of public images in the nation and a great collection of art, uh, partnered with Khan Academy. 
So now all of the Getty Center's education resources are available on Khan Academy's website. And all of the articles are saying, hooray, this is great. All this stuff's available for free. But it already was. If you go to the Getty, it's free. The Getty has always been free. And in their mission, they will always continue to be free. So we haven't changed anything there. And like more, Rory McGreal said on Wednesday in his question to Andrew Ning, if you utilize Khan Academy, you're following a terms of service that do not give you the ownership rights to what you are producing. In fact, they are now owned by Khan Academy. And you are giving them every right into perpetuity for that. Um, so this open education that's happening through the Getty Center is kind of a facsimile of open education. Sure, you have the right to look at their curriculum materials and understand why they thought this Rembrandt was an important 17th century painting, but if you want to do anything with it, now Khan Academy owns that. So at the same time, that's where the Getty Center went. The Getty Center, which has one of the largest education options for students in the nation, didn't decide to do things on their own. They associated themselves with a brand and affiliation. Right. What makes the museum different from your average connectivist MOOC is that it's also a tangible event. So, the Wiseman Museum at Pepperdine University is, they have exhibits coming through all the time. The one that I hitched my wagon to was a Wayne Thiebaud exhibit. Wayne Thiebaud, a California artist most commonly referenced with pop art. Um, it is time, time and space, January 11th to March 30th, 2014. Um, this event happens. People who go to this event do not have to be associated with the MOOC. People who go to MOOCs do not have to be associated with this event. Yet, if you do go to this event, suddenly, oh, hey, there's more options for information for me here. It's not just a dose of giving me the same thing, but in fact, here's some questions that people had in the MOOC that we've decided to put up around some of these art pieces. Here's a text that the curator of this exhibit put together, and it includes some of the writings that have come out of this MOOC. This might be something I'm interested in going to. On the flip side, people who are in that traditional MOOC saying, you know what, I really want to see this. This image just doesn't look the same to me. I want to experience this. There's a public speaker who's coming and speaking next week. Um, if you go to my blog, and I'll put the side up at the end, you can see just a basic template of how one of these moves would work, where you have a guest speaker, you have the museum site open, you have some images that are up for public display, discussion questions, artifact creation opportunities, so on and so forth. Um, now this is where it starts to get cool. The museum augments the tangible and the digital. So. You have these two events together. Separately, they can exist. People who go to the museum don't have to go to the MOOC. People who go to the MOOC don't have to go to the museum. But when you put them together, you get something different. Now, this app from the Museum of London is probably the coolest iPhone app I've ever seen in my life. You walk around London, you hold up your Museum of London iPhone Augment Up London app, and you click it, and it goes through a repository of pictures, and will find a picture from that area, and it will superimpose it on where you are. This is the sweetest thing I have ever seen. I, I, I do not like to, to, to sell the wares of different groups, but I have tweeted about this thing numerous times because I just can't get enough of it. Um, that is an augmented reality. That's the direction that museums seem to be going today. And what we are doing here in the museum is we're taking those people who are going to the MOOC and going to the museum, and what's the experience they're getting? They're getting a much richer you know, learning environment in that. And that's where we all say that learning happens. All right, the learning that, yes. Is it the Museum of London? That, I believe that it is. I might, I, I might okay. need to check that. Just so, it. Just yeah, I'll check it. So yeah, it is the Museum it of is London. London. Yes. It is, okay. Yeah. Okay, I will double check that. I might have written it down wrong. But, um, no, you didn't. Okay. Big fan, keep it up. <laughs> so, um, all right. A uh, museum is a supplement. I'm a poke structuralist. I love Derrida and his idea of the supplement that you, as you learn, as you evolve, as you take things, you kind of create this supplement and it adds to the existing whole. But if you took it away, you would actually be losing something, okay? When we think about learning, we want it to integrate seamlessly into the individual to where we don't know where what they learned starts and where that individual was ends. So, I can't believe it's gone that quickly. That quickly. Um, so that moment, that space where it's seamlessly in there um, is called the supplement. If you're into meditation, you call that the gap where you're not thinking about the past, you're not thinking about the future, you're completely in the present, all right? And that's what we want learning to be. We want that moment where the, all that information is there and now they're doing, they've done the scaffolding, we've passed by the knowledge gaps, and now they're out on their own, okay? So this is the most famous Wayne Thiebaud, it's called Cakes, and this is an example of the gap. All right, this is what Seymour Papert would call kitchen math, all right? Somebody has taken something, seamlessly integrated it into their whole life. 
And unfortunately, I missed Christina's uh, uh, presentation today because there were too many good presentations at that time. Um, but there was a discussion going on about how do we assess CMOOCs? What is the assessment strategy going to be? And it's a really difficult thing to do. How do you assess this? Because I see a lot of people saying, they're cakes, or they're cupcakes. They just copied it. But a lot of us educators look at that and go, they totally got it. So what we need to do is not on them to prove that, it's on us to figure out measurement strategies and instruments in order to show, hey, there is some real kick-ass learning going on here. All right? um, I'm going to move through this one pretty quickly. So museum, obviously, you're not just using and getting some of the things that the museum has written out there into OER, but then the artifacts that are being created by the groups that are in the museum are also OER. Um, digital humanities, a big movement that's happening right now with humanities finally getting themselves on board with the tech landscape. Museums are always the last ones to the party. It's either educators or museums who are fighting for that last chair. And uh, this is a chance for them to finally sit down at the table. Um, and then the MOOC is a non-formal learning space. Why have we formalized all of these great informal and non-formal learning areas? Why are zoos and museums and aquariums and arboretums and planetariums, why is it not now just like going to school? This is an opportunity to rebrand the MOOC not as Coursera Introduction to Statistics, but as an exploration of a museum as it was intended to be. Um, I do want to have a couple of minutes to talk about some of the problems that I have had in implementing this. Uh, the first thing is how much it's going to cost. Well, it's a human resource issue. If you want it to be like those original connectedness MOOCs and you have a spoken wheel where you have a hub and people do their things on their social networks, it's a really low cost that's going to be involved. If you want to control it and have it on an LMS, obviously you're going to have more cost that comes into that. Um, protection of intellectual property, like I said, this has been an issue in museums for over 300 years. Uh, what's interesting is 40 years ago, John Berger did a great BBC documentary called Ways of Seeing, and he said, you know what, it's, the cat's out of the bag. These images are already being reproduced, and people are still going to the museum because it's about a pilgrimage and a way of, you know, a rite of passage to go and see these things and truly experience them. That's not going to change. It hasn't changed in this time. We've been digitizing you know, objects for a very long time, and people keep going. The gentleman at the Wiseman Center said, you know what, I see something more than cakes in that picture, but no one else is. Why are people going to sign up to learn about a guy who painted cakes? And there's a little bit of truth to that question. However, all of us are here. All of us have dedicated our time and our resources for open education, and people have come. Now, you can't tell a multi-million multi dollar institution, people will come, Ray. You know, people will come. You can't, you, you can't just hope that that's going to be the case. Um, but there are a number of ways. One of the things that we've talked about is utilizing this in professional development and having this be something that teachers are really going to be focusing on, getting that you know, museum and art history education group to come in here. Um, Internet or intranet, you have different issues that you have with each one as you're going to host it. Um, and then the place of the expert in a user creator society. Um, I, I bristle when people say facilitator because I feel like facilitator is one step away from saying people aren't experts. I was in two sessions here, and both times people were saying, when I host a MOOC, I don't have to be the expert. And I have a problem with the word the in there because expertise doesn't mean one person. We're all experts in a lot of different ways. And if you think about Vygotsky, and you think about zones of proximal development, expertise is fluid, and people are going to be moving into, and you think about Wanger and communities of practice. Experts come up and rise up when they are needed and when they are necessary, and then they go back. And that's what expertise should be. So if we want to call that facilitation, I'm fine with that. But we can't go down the slippery slope and suddenly, well, we're not experts. You find the one person who really knows it, and you stick with them. Um, this is fearful for museums because they have been that one person for such a long time. And what is it going to mean if there are resistance and oppositional readings happening in a museum? Personally, I think that's what a museum is supposed to be for. Let's not just have the same dominant narrative told over and over again. Any of you have ever been to, to the Berlin Film Museum? It's one of the most amazing experiences you can have, especially if you go into the Holocaust wing of that museum. Um, they have all of these, it's, it's very dry and very static, and there's a big sign that says, we can't ignore who we were from 1928 to 1944. So here it is. And there are these drawers that you can open up, and you can find information on it. And they have included, you know, they include their, their, their pomp, their pageantry, and their, um, their propaganda, but they've also included those, those negotiated and oppositional readings to that time. Um, and that's what museums were intended to be. I will leave you on this, and if you want to have questions, I will hang around later. Um, so people say it's a great painting. You see something different every time you view it. Why then are the places that host these great paintings doing the same pedagogical things every time we walk in? That's the question for us to go out and figure. Thank you. For your time.